This is going to be part three of biochemistry unit. So we are going to discuss macromolecules and we can see that macromolecules make up a large portion of living tissues, the rest of it being water. And there are four different classes of macromolecules. We have proteins, we have nucleic acids, carbohydrates, and lipids. So macromolecules are made up of smaller units called monomers. So these monomers are going to be linked into polymers and they are linked by covalent bonding. So if we look at a protein, we're going to see that those smaller units are going to be a amino acids. If we look at the carbohydrate, we're going to see smaller units are monosaccharides. And nucleic acids are going to be made um, by linking nucleotides together. There is an exception as far as polymers go because uh, lipids are actually not true polymers. And we understand that lipids are nonpolar hydrophobic type of molecules, so they're not going to link, they're not going to link up like the rest of the polymers. Um, they're going to interact by hydrophobic interactions and van der Waals, and they're going to be aggregating together into these little lipid droplets, and they're going to be excluded by water because water molecules are polar, and there's there are hydrogen bonds that are happening, so those are going to be stronger than hydrophobic interactions. So lipids will aggregate together, and you can see here in a adipocyte cell, these are the accumulations of little fat droplets. And yes, they are made up of smaller units, and then we're going to discuss them when we get to that part. So how do we actually form a polymer? So through condensation reaction. You can also call condensation reaction dehydration synthesis, because this is exactly what's happening here. If we have a um, a shorter polymer, let's say this is unit one, this is two, and we want to add monomer number three, you can see that functional groups are going to come together and they're going to react. And of course, there is an enzyme that's going to facilitate this reaction. So when the functional groups come together, they will form water. Water is going to be removed. And this is how the actual covalent bond um, is going to form between the units. So the opposite of condensation or dehydration would be hydrolysis, hydrolysis. That means we are going to be adding water to be able to break the bond, digest this long polymer. And um, the addition of water, notice, restores the functional groups. And yes, there is an enzyme that's going to carry out or help with the facilitation of this set of reactions. So we're looking at a breakdown of a, of a polymer into smaller units. So, and yes, this is digestion, just like you can imagine if you ate food and a piece of protein, the piece of protein was digested into individual amino acids, and then your body will have these building blocks to build their own muscle or their own um, protein, whatever it is that they're trying to do. So, all right, let's talk about the carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a ratio of 1 to 2 to 1. And uh, in order to qualify as a monosaccharide, a simple sugar, we would have to see three carbon at atoms in a compound, also several hydroxyl groups, and also one carbonyl group. And um, as far as the function goes, carbohydrates, you already know that they are going to provide energy to fuel cellular reactions because we have mitochondria that needs to receive glucose and oxygen in order to synthesize ATP. And ATP are the molecules that your cells can utilize for energy. Um, then the carbohydrates can be stored. So that's the energy storage. They can be stored as glycogen or starches. If you're an animal, you will store carbohydrates in the form of glycogen. If you're a plant, you will store carbohydrates in the form of starches. Um, carbohydrates, sugars can also serve as raw materials. So if you look at DNA or RNA, you're going to see that a part of the nucleotide is sugar. Remember, nucleotide consists of sugar, phosphate, and the base. So yes, there is a sugar molecule, deoxyribose in DNA and ribose in RNA. Um, carbohydrates can also be located, or they are located in the cell walls of plants. And examples would be cellulose, and um, cell walls are also present in in fungi, so but you'll see a different component there. There's chitin in the cell walls. So again, this provides structural support. And then carbohydrates can be used for cell identification and uh, signaling immune response. So for example, if you have a cell, you can um, you you're gonna notice that there is a a specific chain of sugar molecules that distinguish one cell from the other. And for example, people that get organ transplants. 
um, they would have different patterns in the sugar chains. So it means the immune system would recognize these different patterns and would attack the organ. So there, there would be an organ failure or rejection. So it means a close match needs to be, um, you, so a person would have to get an organ from a very, very close match and then also take the immune suppressant medication for the rest of their life. So those sugar chains serve as ID tags. So, and as I said before, they are unique to every organism, to every person. So what would be the simple form of sugar? That would be a monosaccharide, and you can see these are different isomers, same molecular formula, different architectural structure, and examples of polymers, polysaccharides that we're going to discuss would be starches, cellulose, glycogen, and chitin. So a simple sugar is a monosaccharide, and um, it can vary in the number of carbons it has. So the minimum number is going to be three, so you can see right here. Um, but yes, you will see sugars with six carbon atoms, also five. So if they have six, we call them hexose, example would be glucose. If they have five, we call them pentose, example would be ribose and deoxyribose. Um, now, this is going to be important for you to be able to count the carbon atoms in the sugar molecule. So we are going to begin right here. And remember, I told you that every corner represents a carbon. However, there is one exception. So this corner right here is not a carbon atom. This corner right here is um, used up by a, taken up by oxygen. So then we're going to find oxygen and then we're going to go clockwise to be able to count the number of carbons. So let's do this. So this is oxygen, carbon number one, carbon number two, carbon number three, carbon number four, carbon number five, and then you would want to go here. However, you're not, notice the last carbon number six is hanging off the ring. So here it is. So this is glucose, hexose. And then in the case of ribose, same thing. So you find the oxygen and go clockwise, one, two, three, four, and number five. And then what I have right here in the slide also how a linear glucose molecule the structure can actually form a ring and this is what happens usually in the aqua solutions this is a type of ring the type of glucose shape you're going to see and you can pause here and examine how these atoms come together to form that ring um as far as functional groups determining function you guys yes you already know this and you can see we're revisiting carbonyl groups examples would be aldehydes and ketones and this is just to illustrate the diversity in sugar molecules and the location of functional groups um a quick question here for you um let's say we have a molecule below which would be this one and do you think this molecule is a monosaccharide so you can pause here think about it and see if you can answer the question and um, here's another question uh, or similar question but it's a different structure and then we have the third possibility um, whether or not this would be a monosaccharide okay so I do have the answers right here you can pause and go ahead and read about them and see if you actually got them right all right let's talk about how we build polymers um, carbohydrates specifically carbohydrates so we have two monosaccharides and there's glucose there's another glucose glucose at position number one is offering hydroxyl group and another glucose at position number four carbon number four is offering also hydroxyl group so you can see those two come together we have OH OH so we make an H2O and one oxygen is going to be left behind and this is going to be that bond we call that bond, the type of covalent bond, glycosidic linkage. And of course, an enzyme is going to facilitate um, the formation of this bond. So if we take two monosaccharides, such as glucose and fructose, we, we combine them together and we are going to form what we, what we call disaccharides. So example would be sucrose. And then, for example, galactose and, and glucose will form lactose. So lactose. So these are different forms of sugar. And um, if there's only two simple sugars together, that would be a disaccharide, okay? All right, so what about the polysaccharides? So polysaccharides are going to have more than two. And examples of polysaccharides would be starches, glycogen, cellulose, and chitin. And I'm going to go over one by one right now. So let's take a look at starches. You know that starches are present in plants. That's how plants store their carbohydrates. And uh, starches are typically easy to digest. And I'll tell you why. Because the linkages are 1 to 4. And they are arranged in a very simple linear fashion. And um, the type of glucose 
present in the starch is called alpha glucose and um, an example of starch would be amylose and you can see how amylose they have a ring but it also kind of coils in a little spiral um, spiral um, way like a little spring and um, so we can we can also have linkages occur not only between one and four but also between one and six in the case of amylopectin a t different type of starch so this would be just simple linear and this would be branch so we can zoom in here and see if we can count the carbon atoms and see how this one to six linkage occurs so i'm going to take this glucose molecule so here's oxygen so this means this is going to be one two three four five carbon number six right there and now here's my linkage glycosidic linkage so it means this glucose molecule there's the oxygen so it's going to be one two three four five and carbon number six right there so sure enough we have a linkage between carbon number one and carbon number six so this is what you do when you want to make a branch glycogen is going to be um, storage polysaccharide in animals and it's going to be localized in liver and muscle cells uh, for example when your blood sugar levels drop that means you have to restore the balance and maintain homeostasis glycogen is going to be broken down so all these individual glucose molecules are going to be broken down and released into the bloodstream so that way they can be carried um, and delivered to your cells and your cells have mitochondria and mitochondria is going to convert glucose and oxygen into ATP so that you can continue with energy production. So the same thing happens when you experience a fight or flight response, when you get super nervous, um, the, um, the stress hormones are released and then they cause the breakdown of glucose. So that way that provides it immediate access to energy so that you can run for your dear life even though if you're not running but your body thinks you will uh, but it will fuel those muscle cells um cellulose is another type of polysaccharide but cellulose is only found in the cell walls of plants so if we zoom in into the actual cell wall of the plant we're going to see that there, there are these microfibrils and they are they look so tightly woven like a like some sort of fabric or textile and then if you pull out one of those microfibrils you're going to see they're actually linked into that chain and you've got your glycosidic linkages happening here and then also what's going on there are cross linkages so it means all these long chains of glucose are going to be linked up by additional bonds so you make this sheet um, cellulose is actually very hard to digest humans do not digest cellulose because we do not have an enzyme to be able to do so and also the reason um, why this is such a tough fiber is because it's made up of beta glucose molecules so here's an example of what alpha glucose look like and we saw that in starches um, and here's the beta glucose and actually the only difference is the location or the position of this hydroxyl group so you can see this is the alpha glucose so you can see where um, high hydroxyl group is located and then how they all are going to be arranged in this same orientation okay but now if you take the beta glucose that that makes up the cellulose notice that ox, uh, the hydroxyl group is actually located right here the one that's going to participate in the formation of the bond and then here's another hydroxyl group that's right here so imagine if you put two beta glucose molecules so it means we're looking at so this is one this is two so we need to form a bond right here do you see how far away they are from one another flip this molecule so that this guy right here that was sitting up high is going to go down right there so that and you can see the actual flippage happening so let's look at this example so you can see how the ch2oh is over here and then it would normally be over here as well but in this point it's all the way over here because you have to literally reverse that molecule so it looks like every other beta glucose mon uh, monomer is upside down so that's how you can form these glycosidic bonds and that's what makes it very unique and um, you have to have a specific enzyme to to be able to break this down um the last uh polymer and polysaccharide that one I, that I want to address is chitin. So chitin is a structural material that is found in fungal cell walls and also in 
arthropods. If you look at their exoskeletons, you're going to see they have this very crunchy, very tough, resistant surface. And um, the actual chitin is not completely um, sugar molecules. It's actually um, a derivative of glucose. And then if you look at it, you're going to see that there is a sugar molecule, but there is also the presence of nitrogen. So the actual formula for chitin is going to be C8H13O5, and you can see, oh, there is nitrogen right here. And then, of course, those linkages are the same exact as in, uh, as in carbohydrates, so these are called glycosidic linkages. And if you look at the fungi cell wall, here is the phospholipid layer, and that's your membrane. And then on top, we have the cell wall, and then you can see a layer of chitin is going to be embedded right here. Okay, alrighty, that will do it for now.